to start. Welcome to the first of the guest lecture series for the College of Architecture and Planning in the 1996-97 year. This evening, we're fortunate to have Chip Sullivan with us. He comes from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, the College of Environmental Design. And I think you'd like to know a little bit more about him before he gets into his talk this evening. He's a landscape architect and he's an artist that lives in Berkeley. Berserkly, I'm uh, corrected. Uh, with a bachelor's of landscape architecture and a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Florida. He has also studied painting and drawing at the Arts Students League in New York City. And I think you'll see this evening that he has a broad variety of scholarly and creative interests and endeavors that he has pursued. For about 10 years, uh, Chip has been studying and reinterpreting the traditional garden, and in particular, he's been exploring the potential of classical and historical landscape elements as passive architectural devices for environmental control. In 1984 and 85, he received the prestigious Rome Prize that's presented by the American Academy in Rome, and there he continued to study gardens of the Persian and Italian variety, and working on ex exhibitions. These exhibitions that include drawings and box constructions and the garden and reliquaries uh, illustrate a delicate balance between humans and nature. And these exhibits have been shown uh, in New York City and throughout the United States and Canada and Italy and have traveled throughout the United States and Canada to many schools of architecture and design. You've seen his face in progressive architecture, landscape architecture, the architecture review, art forum, garden design, and at one time he was a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Presently, he is an associate professor of landscape architecture in Berkeley. We welcome him tonight, Chip Sullivan. Slides, please. What I'm going to talk about tonight basically is just to show you some things that turn me on. Because I think the drawing process and the creative process is primarily about looking at your environment and finding specific things that turn you on. And also, like, it's those things that you grew up with, I think, are really important. Like, I grew up with Mad Magazine. I don't know if there's anything comparable to that, but I had to learn from, since I really have, don't have a formal training in drawing, I had to learn from the things that were around me. So Mad Magazine was primarily one of my major influences. Also, I grew up in that generation where we had model train sets. And I think this idea of creating a miniature world what, you know, like really help this, this powers of imagination that I think are really important to uh, the creative process. So I think it's important to, to what I want to do tonight is kind of show you these two threads that, that, have, that have contributed to my work, show you people's work that I like, and where those things, how, where those things finally ended up with, and I'm going to finish up with some of the, my own work. Now on the left we have uh, one of my favorite artists of all times. This, was, this page layout is done by Wally Wood. And one of the things that, that I like about it is look at the contrast of light and dark. And I grew up drawing, whoa, I'm going to tell myself before I get started. I grew up drawing, copying these wonderful, look at this machinery in this drawing. Look at the imagination, look at the page layout. I mean, I think that the use of the line here, Wally Wood's use of black and white and shade, and the, the sort of the power of suggestion by what he's left out, you know, like the use of the, of the dark shadow to form the, the open space, I think is really beautiful. And also, you look at the crazy path. George Herman's uh, wonderful page layouts. Look at the forms, and look at the landscape. I mean, there's nothing, this was a, this was a full, full spread, spread in the Sunday Magazine. There's really nothing to compare with this kind of page layout today. But look at how he's used the circle to unify the page, and then contrast it with this rectangle. And look at the use of light and dark here. And the terrific landscape. You know, I mean, this is all about landscape and, and the, the relationship of individual characters.
characters to the landscape, I think it's wonderful. The contrast of the light and dark, and then finishing up with this dark panel, and then this wonderful little panel at the very bottom. I mean, this, this person's work is really, really worth studying. Well, one of my favorite uh, things of all time, I mean, I have, well, I'm going to have to show you a lot of my favorite things of all time, but this, this study for one of Walt Disney's animated features, you know, really exhibits this idea of what drawing can be about. The ability to kind of like think multidimensionally and think in animated space. I mean, here the animator is setting a scene. Look how he's framing the picture plane. And look at how he's used different color, uh, color pencils to indicate the motion. So in this, this is not just a single glimpse in time, but here the drawing is showing us this whole process of movement that he's thinking out maybe three or four minutes in a, in a whole animated motion. I just think this, what's happening here is really wonderful. It really shows us the potential of drawing. And if you look at the early Disney films, where, look at the, look at the landscape that they've created in this drawing. You know, it's wonderful, even though it's all quilted. Look at the, the patterns of the landscape. Look at how they were thinking of, of the landscape, that the characters, you know, here we have characters filled within a set. Here the characters are filling this landscape. It's incredibly creative. Look at the way that tree is drawn there. And then the use of shadows. Look at the mouse characters in the bottom here. And look at, look at how the, their shadows move up and create this very eerie pattern in the explosion of the fountain in the center. Look at that. It's even as a landscape design. You know, as a spatial, the spatial qualities of these things, I think, are just really wonderful. from 
these t-shirts. In addition to Mad Magazine, and probably this will probably be probably bigger than how I am where I am today because of this. But this was my art gallery that I grew up with. You know, learning how to draw cars, <coughs> learning his composition from people like Ed Rock. And this is my, I hate to admit, this is my, my bedroom in high school. This is my studio. And you can see like even a little interpretation of taking these things and turning them into something else had, had an, uh, you know, like a really important influence. Now I want to mention something about the California custom car and how that relates to design. It relates in a couple of ways that I think are really important. For one thing, what was happening in Detroit in the 50s, the design got really segmented into different departments. The stylists were separated from the interior designers, the, car, the consultants were separated, the engineers were separated out. And what you had was, was designed by committee. And as a result, you ended up with somewhat, you know, like very interesting automobiles. But the thing was, the designer of the body shape didn't know how to take an engine apart. And what was interesting about the California car designers, and I think this really relates to the design professions, is during World War II, when those kids were too young to go off to war, and they wanted to have cars, they would go to junkyards and collect parts of cars and put them together. They, did my mic go off? The mic go off. No. It's okay? all this technology. They were able to like take a car apart, take a motor apart, and reassemble cars into, you know, like things that would operate. And then the whole idea of being able to take this car and develop it into performance, I think there's a great analogy there. And you can maybe see why we lost the car, you know, the, the, the edge on the car industry, because the people designing cars didn't know how they were in. And if you find that California custom designer like really knew how things work. And I think that really applies to art and design profession. And what you see here is two fiberglass body cars by Ed Roth. And the other thing I find interesting about these people as a role model is they didn't do it for the money. You know, like New York City artists carry their slides with them all the time. You're always trying to get a you know an exhibit and sell a painting for fifty thousand dollars. Uh, these car designers, these custom car designers, built these cars for the love of it. I mean, every time they had a spare moment or a spare change, they would work two jobs to work on the car in their garage and assemble it. And Roth did something really unique. It's, you know, like he got tired of dealing with the metal frames of the metal parts of cars. So he designed a system where he could make he could all up wads of paper and cover it with fiberglass and shape the fiberglass and then make a mold and cast it from the fiberglass. And here you see two of these very first cars you know, totally created without, you know, like any existing automobile frame. The imagination, you know, the idea of accentuating what an automobile really is, you know, this idea of performance and movement and beauty all come together in these two cars. And you'll find an interesting thing about this, this is the first glass bubble on a car. Ed Rock had a friend who had a pizza parlor, and he couldn't get an oven big enough, and he got a sheet, he got a sheet of plastic and built this sand, a pile of sand in the pizza oven and put the fiberglass on top of the sheet of plexiglass and you know did it several times till he got it at the right temperature to get it home. I'm not sure the pizza would be that good uh, after that. Now this is a, 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 a Arlen Nest in San Francisco is one of the uh, I guess world famous uh, motorcycle designers and custom motorcycle designers. And I wanted to show you these two slides for a specific reason. My friend and I went down there to find uh, the, to find the place where he stored all of the cars that he worked with. And you know, I'd been down there two or three times before, and I didn't know how to ask the right questions. Finally, I went to one of the guys behind the counter, and I said, I would really like to see Arlen Ness Private Motorcycle Museum. He said, okay. So he took me down, down the back of this little hallway, up these stairs, and into this room on the back, of the back of the repair shop, into this sort of inner sanctum. And what's neat about this, this is, this is where Arlen designs his motorcycles. And you can even see, when we were there, he had just left. And you can see these designs. So you can see the process through the design, that the, that the motorcycle design didn't just happen. But here he is, you know, like working out these designs. But what I think is even cooler, here he's surrounded by his works of art. I mean, these are rolling works of art. And be that inner sanctum, you know, the studio that, you know, in addition to being able to draw and being part of the design process, the studio, the, what you surround yourself with, I think is really important. And it really comes through in Arlen Ness's uh, inner sanctum. Which brings up another point about the environment that we surround ourselves with. This slide, this is a Buddhist uh, meditation center in Japan. 
And what's, what's scary about this, here people are meditating on TV images of landscape. And I, I mean, I just find that a terrifying thought. You know, and I really believe that, the, that the, the visual environment that we surround ourselves with really affects the design quality or the design work that we do. This is a, a 15th century painting of, I think, St. Jerome's studio. I mean, we can see a big leap here in what people meditate on and how that affects the design process. Here, in all the tools of the trade, you know, like all of these tools of knowledge, and the, you see the importance of the book, you see the importance of the relationship of natural light to the interior, the importance of being surrounded by objects that inspire you, that the, the Renaissance designer, the Renaissance thinker, the Renaissance philosopher was supposed to be surrounded with these things that would, that would uh, imply and sort of instigate uh, beautiful thoughts and, and thoughts. And I think that idea of what the studio, what our environment is, is really incredibly important. And it's, Connect us with the environment that we can't see, you know, to really bring us in contact with the world. 
And Birchfield really did that. He even, even went so far as to try and capture the sound of the landscape. I mean, how many, how many times have we, I mean, how often have we stopped to listen at the landscape, you know, to listen to the noise that the landscape is making? Because we're in such an urban environment, we tend to shut out the sound of the landscape. But here, Birchfield is trying to cap capture the sound of the different, different plants and animals. I mean, he's, if you look at something, the world is a system of vibration, it's energy. And you know, like what he's done here is captured these vibrations of energy in the landscape, you know, and really made us aware of those. And one of the last paintings he did in his life was this one, where he went out to this field. He was trying to capture a certain field feeling. He went out almost 10 years to this landscape and did these series of these are just six of a series of 100 little sketches all throughout the year, at all different times, to capture that feeling of landscape. And this is one of the last paintings he did before he died. You know, so here is like 10 years. What is the time? What is the time element in our life? What is the time that it takes to perceive a landscape? I mean, we're so into this like quick, sort of quick ideas of, 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 and quick landscapes. Here's a painter that took 10 years to study a landscape and then put it on, put it on paper. I think that, I mean, I think that's really an adequate quality. How many of us take that time? Another person that I really admire of the same quality is Joseph Cornell, who, whose art was inspired not so much by the idea to be an artist. I mean, I think you know, you're an artist or you're a creator because you have no choice. You really don't have a choice. And, and, and Cornell was never trained as an artist. You know, like he was like an investigator. He was an explorer. He never, leave, he never left the state of New York. He grew up in New York City all, spent all of his life there never trained as an artist, had a couple years of school. But what's remarkable about Cornell is I think his brother, his brother Joe, you know, was, was severely paralyzed and could only move a couple of fingers. He, was, he could never leave the house. And Cornell was a door-to-door -door salesman or he sold fabrics or he, you know, he did something in, in, in New York City where he took these, you know, these, these trips to the city. And what he would do is he started making this art to bring the world that his brother couldn't see um, back to him. He created these little boxes that had things that would move that his brother could move with just a few fingers that he could operate to bring this, you know, this wonderful world back into it. And I think that's really a beautiful way that art is, art is this thing that motivates for something other than just, you know, making money. You know, it really came from the heart. And there, you know, like, and that's how he grew into making these little reliquaries, these little box construction that are about the universe, you know, they're about this, about the beyond, about the mystery of life. And you see another thing too is like look at the I love this picture of a studio where he in these foyers that he would make out he would collect things that this artwork just didn't happen like that it happened over a period of time of collecting ephemeral objects categorizing them and then all of a sudden the artwork would come together and the other thing that he would do is even after he sold the piece you had to sign an agreement that if he wanted to change it he could he could he could call it back at any time and work on it I think that's remarkable. You know, that, that art just doesn't stop in time. You know, that it has this connection. You know, when you look at his work, there's a sense of this. If you look at his pieces, there's an incredible sense of mystery and longing. And if you get to the Chicago Art Institute, there's a whole room. It's hard to find. It's almost like a Cornell box. I've been to the Art Institute four or five times before I finally found this goddamn room. And it's really worth the trip if you can find the room. Because even the way the, the exhibition is set up, there are chairs, on tables, glass tables, where you sit down and contemplate the work. It's not something you just walk right by. And I think that's something else about design. You know, some we want to create things that are can engage people for not just the t temporary time. But when I won the Rome Prize, and I went to New York, I went, I went to New York City first to study for a while, and then I went to Italy, and it was a critical point in my work. And I wanted to start to uh, change the direction of the pieces that I was working in. So I, when I got to Rome, I just let things settle in. I just started to look at things. And one of the things that I started to notice that, that sort of hit me in a funny way is this, how we deify other humans, you know, how we deify the saints, and how we deify this religion, and the box, the, the, the reliquaries, and uh, the triptychs, and the settings, of the, the theatrical, theatrical settings of the more meetings. Uh, sculpture here is truly a phenomenal three-dimensional thing. Hidden behind here is a skylight that lets the light down as golden rays. And just the theater, the theater of this thing, you know, this whole setting, 
And I started to think about, well, maybe there's a way that I can deify nature, that I can take this idea of the garden, the temporal qualities of the garden, and the environment, and the degradation of the environment, and, and sort of create icons, reliquaries, and triptychs that would put this, this, this work, this idea of the, the temporal quality of the garden into its own space. So I started to make box constructions. And I was interested in this system of death. You know, I'm interested in theater and the, the, the theatrics of illusion, the theatrics of animation. And one of the things that I always liked about Disney's films were the, um, the multi-plane camera. And if you've seen particularly Snow White and Seven Doors, the characters are moving through the landscapes. It's like the landscape is alive. The, the, the background is moving. And if you're in a car or something and you can look at a, a, a landscape, you watch that the background moves. It's relatively stationary. The, before, the mid ground is moving at a different speed and the foreground is moving very rapidly. And all three of these landscapes are moving in a different direction. I haven't been able to capture that in the box construction yet, but a stationary box. But this is what the multi-camera a plane, multi-plane camera did for Disney. The animated sills would set up here, and each one of these things was a different background, you know, foreground, middle ground, background, atmosphere, each one of these things. And as the character moved across this, and as the camera panned through the landscape, it really became alive. Um, so this was, a, this was one of those things in which you really can't see in a slide, but it's about three feet deep. And each one of these planes of the landscape is cut out to give this give this idea of dimension. These are landscape rollers, where the landscape moves around. They're painted on uh, accountant's paper. You get that idea of the landscape you know, as, as an element which can be for sale. And these are different elements that can be moved around and give the feeling of landscape as uh, the, 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 the vocabulary of landscape, taking things apart and moving them around. So these were small box constructions, small reliquaries when I tried to Look at the, you know, create landscapes that we look in a different way. Also try to show those hidden flows of energy that are happening beyond the landscape. The things that we can't see. What is happening? You know, like dividing them up into dualities, making three-dimensional space that you can get into, looking at things that were hidden, you know, like trying to find, you know, the hidden meaning of the landscape. Then later I started to do these triptychs based on the religious triptychs, which were designed to tell stories that would be folded up and hidden away during times of religious strife. The idea of being of the landscape being able to tell a story, you know, that you have this enclosed box, you open it up, and the interior is revealed. This whole system of storytelling is revealed in the interior. And also, the idea of the, move, the, 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 the taxonomy of the landscape, that things can be taken apart and moved around. And all of these box constructions, they're elements that you can manipulate and move. So the other thing I started to look at, after I did a whole series of box constructions for a number of years, I, and I moved to California, I started to look at this this element of the California landscape, which was uh, designed by Echo and Tommy Church and others, where they started to look at Cubist painting as an influence in landscape design, where they broke away from the central axis and used this idea of multi-planes, you know, as you move through the landscape, different, different, different things happen. Echo was really influenced by uh, this book that, that categorized uh, or, or photographs of this big international exposition that happened in Paris between the wars, where they had for the first time a whole new style of landscape architecture based on cubism. And it only lasted for a short period of time. And when I was at the GSD, uh, someone had checked out this book on that exposition and found out that when Echo was at, was at Harvard, he had checked this book out about 30 times. So this idea of cubism, I mean, so like his ideas were sort of reinvented cubism. So coming to California, I wanted to take this idea of the energy flow, like the positive and negative powers of nature, and, and look at creating gardens. And the other analogy I want to make is that, you know, when you have ideas, the most powerful tool you have is to draw them. You can't just sit around and wait for a great client to come to you and, and uh, you know, create, uh, create it. You know, like, you have to, like, keep working at it, working out these ideas so when the time comes, you have a stock of ideas that you're ready to create. But you just don't wait for the proper, the proper moment is not going to come unless you really get into it and try to make it happen. So I experimented like for several years, this whole idea of taking the central axis, breaking away, what would the new form of the garden be in California? You know, based on these elements of the four, of the four elements, you know, the changing seasons, uh, the, these capturing these hidden energy flows of nature. You know, how would they look? I was really interested.
Augusta, you create an entirely new garden form that would take Echo's California garden form and, and change it and see, see where that would go. Now, I said I was interested in taxonomy because the other thing I find fascinating about Western culture is how we tend to like want to classify everything. You know, everything has to be broken apart given a name. And I was really interested in doing an installation that took this idea of taxonomy, you know, and miniaturization, and put it into glass, glass, box, glass, glass jars, glass specimen jars. So the entire exhibit would be nothing but um, shells with these glass bottles on them. It would be entirely, it would be a thing where you can walk into the space, pick up the glass jars, look at them, and even move them around in a different order. Because I was really interested in that idea of order, but out of that comes disorder. So each one of these little uh, miniature, they're very, very small, miniaturized landscape. You know, it's trying to say something about what, how we separate out, and containerize, and create these whole little miniature environments, which could relate to, you know, the design on the edge of the highways or different community designs in America. I mean, how we how we segregated, you know, and isolated the landscape into these individual little environments that don't really relate, you know, at all. Here, the only relationship is the, is the glass specimen jar. So the other evolution of my work came about after you know, years of making box constructions, making the specimen jars, designing, designing gardens, I started to do installations. Because I worked in a large scale form for quite a number of years. And I, I decided that what I, what I really wanted to do, and it's really hard sometimes in your life to narrow it down, what is it that really makes you happy? Well, I decided I really like to paint, I really like to draw, I really like to make things. I like to make things by my, by my hand, by my own self, and I like to build them. And this idea of the environmental installation was, was, a, was, was an element, category that I naturally fit into. And uh, this is one of the first installations I did called the, called the Garden of the Four Elements, or the Botanic Garden, where the garden is broken into these four different elements. And it's really interesting because during the Renaissance, early Renaissance, it was felt that during this era of exploration of all the different con uh, continents, that if they could bring back the plants from each one of these four continents and put them in the right order in each one of these four corners of the botanic garden, they could recreate paradise. And then also the idea that these plants, that these botanic gardens, are uh, encyclopedias of knowledge. You know, that here we're collecting this knowledge from all over the world and bringing it together. So this idea was this idea of Charles Birchfield kind of capturing those hidden energy flows of nature, putting them together into some sort of diorama composition of multi-plane so that the planes move as you move through it was alive and expressed the world of nature. Also this idea of the gazing globe at the very center where the four elements, the four cross paths, you know, like give a different newer numerical composition as they move as, they, as you move through the garden. Also this idea of the positive effects of nature and also the negative. I mean in California the landscape is something that's beautiful but at the same time can kill us. You know, so this idea of the duality of nature. That nature is not all just good. It's also, you know, can be harmful. So what happened was after, after when you do installations, where do you put them? You know, this ended up in my, it traveled for a while, ended up in my mother's garage for five years. Every time she called me on the phone, she said, Chip, when you get that thing out of the garage, the termites are eating it, you know, it's driving me crazy. So finally I went home and I rented the van and I was loading it up in the van and her next door neighbor came by and he said, what are you doing with that? That's really pretty. And I said, I'm taking it for the dump. And he said, well, you know, I'm building, I'm building a cottage in the woods. Can, you, can I have it? I'll put it in my cottage. I said, that's no problem. Just send me a photograph. So lo and behold, he sends me this photograph. And here's my artwork decorating his outhouse. <laughs> so I mean, the work lives on, but I don't know. You know, at least I didn't take it to the dump. So when, you know, when I came to California and I started to do these, these sketches of what I thought the California garden might look like, um, I had an opportunity to do this outdoor installation called the Garden of the Four Elements. And when I flew into California for the first time, I was looking out the airplane window and everything was on fire. As far as you can see, the Sierra Mountains were on fire. Then the other thing that happened when I was there, it rained for six weeks. And houses were sliding off the mountains. And what, you know, like everything was, everything was, floods were, were killing people. And then there was a drought for six years. And the earth parched and cracked. And then there were the earthquakes. And then there were the fires. 
You know, so it, it's been, you know, so I said this would be what would the new California garden look like? So I related those those kind of elements of the, the landscape, the California landscape, into a garden called the Garden of the Four Elements, which is based on the four Platonic solids. And in this, the first Platonic solid is at the very center. The Platonic solid for Earth is a cube. And what I did is I used broken pieces of concrete from foundations and retaining walls from, from the earthquake that had cracked and ripped apart. And then behind that, I planted a, a parterre. I was also interested in what would these new parterres look like. So this parterre was filled with earth and then, then flooded so that as evaporation and the dryness of the landscape was happening, you would start to see the earth parch and crack and fall apart. So that the, the cube in the center, the earth is falling down and moving. You're tracking the movement of the earth through the earthquakes with this crumbling debris as it falls down and also watching the earth slowly crack apart. And then the element of fire is a, in the platonic solid is a pyramid. So in this parterre, I surrounded it by a, a, a burnt picket fence that had been charred and burned in one of the fires that went through the burnt the burnt the hills. And the parterre, the ground plane, was planted or covered with, with burnt wood and uh, debris from the forest. And in the very center of it, the very center of it was the pyramid formed by burnt and charred timbers from houses that, that, that had been burned in the Burgundy Hills. So I was trying to create something that would cause a sort of sense of contemplation. You know, like, and also, you know, what is the new form of the California garden that really relates to the landscape? Here, the element of air is a double-sided pyramid. So what I did is I used a, a wellhead from Venice that all of the decoration had been taken away by the acid rain. And then this pyramid of specimen jars is placed on a, uh, a mirror. Like this. And I found the California Citizens for a Better Environment had, had rated the top 50 corporations in California that had polluted. And uh, they rated them from 1 to 50. So at the very top, I put IBM, where it was, what they produced, and what they're polluting the air with. And then each jar had a label, a number, so from 1 to 50. And, and this was on a mirror, which gave it the sense of the double-sided pyramid. And also, as the light came through it, it gave this eerie phosphorescent sort of glow. And I was really, I was really pleased about what the corporation was. This is a piece I did with Francis Butler here at the Cap Street Project, another alternative gallery in San Francisco. And what we were interested in doing was creating this blue grotto. You know, this, this something that would, that would be about the axis movement that runs from the heavens to the center of the earth, and about these ethereal landscape elements. The ethereal elements, you know, the water, air, the warm great alice, you know, the movement of clouds, the movement of rain. So what we decided to do, this is a model of the piece because I can't really show you a photograph of the complete piece. We created these large viewer-operated dioramas where, these, where the viewer can operate the landscape with these cranes. We built this thing in her studio, and then when we, found, when we measured it where we were to take it, we found out that it wouldn't fit. It's like somebody <coughs> builds a board in their basement and you can't get it out. Well, we found out that what we had to do was cut apart, cut off the legs of all these things, and then I had to use all these guys you know, here, and here it is, here they are on the back of the trucks going off to the exhibit. We had to carry, we, 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 very, we almost didn't get it into the museum. It's quite embarrassing. And it had to be totally reassembled. So here you see the element of, of sky and clouds. And the fewer operated crane through the use of optical illusions and the moray effect. These objects would, would turn and move, move. You know, like they, they would create the illusion of movement. This is the road borealis, which was also operated by a crane. And you would get this the moray effect of, of, the, of, the, of the different lights moving through the air. And each one of these, this is the, the mist of the spray on the, uh, off the ocean. And this was plexiglass cut with holes and it lit from, it lit from underneath and gave a really wonderful sort of feeling of the spray of water. And then in the center, these four huge dioramas enclosed this very center part where we wanted the, the viewer to feel like they were going into the center of the earth and the axis moonbeam was crushing down from the heavens into the center of the earth like a large tattoo. And we used these specimen jars to enclose uh, 
specimens, or should I say skulls, of animals that, that were extinct. And these were all lit from the inside. So when you entered inside this interior space, you were confronted with this system of death. You know, the, it definitely confronted with uh, this idea of, um, you know, like the reduction of the, the, the living species on Earth. This was, this was supposed to be shown in the San Francisco Garden Show until the committee came and took a look at it. And they said, no, this is not what we want the and learner to be aware of. This is my best friend, Vince. And Vince and I like cars. He's got like a 71 convertible Catalina. And we cruise around in it. And that's one of the nice things about growing up on the East Coast, I'm always dreaming of going to California and cruising around. It's something as an adult I can finally do. Um, and this is often, when I, when I can find a guy, I'll have someone bring a custom car to my class. And we'll, he'll talk about what he did to the car. And this is a 49 Mercury one of Vince's friends, and uh, just discuss the design element, why different pieces of chrome have been taken off, why the hood is shaped in a certain way, what is the form, you know, what is the evolution of the car, why did Detroit build it a certain way, and why did the custom car designer want to chop the top and lower it, why is that, what, what aesthetic decisions are made in, 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 that, in, that, in that realm. But Vince and I spent a lot of time at car shows. And we have this ongoing aesthetic discussion about what is the perfect flame. Now, this is a flame, but this is the perfect flame. I mean, this is beautiful. This is a 49 Mercury. You know, and when I talk about the, the, the body of the car as a canvas, you know, I mean, here you have this really accentuates this idea of movement and speed, you know, like and art and, and the metal as a canvas. And look at there's some really nice cars in this here. I mean, this to me is an art gallery. You know, and these designers are the unsung heroes, like from California and the world. I mean, the people that throw throw metal together in New York City and get up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, don't put anywhere near the work and love that goes into this. That's what I think is another important thing: the work and love that goes into this. There's no monetary gain. You know, it's that, that's what design should be. You know, it should be, we should be changing, increasing the quality of our environment for the love of it, not for the dollar value. So Vince and I would sit spend a lot of time in bars on napkins and at eating, and I don't know what, what came first, but this is another part of the design process that I think is really important. It's oftentimes really hard to be sitting at a table, you know, and with a blank sheet of paper. Where do those ideas come from? It's very zen in a way. Those ideas come from, I mean, you can't get it unless you sit and study. But when do the ideas come? You know, you've got to be ready. That's why you should always carry your sketchbook with you. You should be ready to grasp those ideas at any time. And oftentimes, while we're in a bar or something, this is where we're coming up with the idea of the perfect flame. Since Vince is a metal worker, he's trying to come up with the idea of doing the least amount of work because he has to do all the cutting. And this was the design for the, for the garden. The, the show, this was for a show in San Francisco where we would design a, a garden, a piece for a garden, and also come up with a garden for that piece. So after these ideas were done, we made a small scale model. And then the next thing we did is we made a large scale model out of it, and then practiced painting it. And this is called the flame around. And this is the piece, and the idea of the shadows, and exhibiting this, this feeling of movement. So no matter where you're at the piece, you know, it looks like it's, 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 uh, it's moving across the floor. And then this, in this piece right here, this was the garden where the flame around is, breaks off a meteor and it comes down to the earth and skids across my garden and then rests in the front, oh, right behind the 49 Mercury grill. <laughs> so one of the things about working really hard, I believe, you know, that the way to you work really, really hard until you get the idea done, and then you party really hard. You, know, you take some time off until the next until the next thing happens. And this is in North Beach. This is my favorite place. This is City Lights Book, City Lights Bookstore, where the, the beat generation in the West Coast happened. This is Vesuvio's and Tosca's. It's my other favorite bar with the best Irish coffee in San Francisco. It's right across the street. And this is Vince. This is early in the evening, and this is at the end of the evening. <laughs> So the other thing, like in Miami years ago, I, I you know, like Chinese takeout box was a really beautiful thing. 
you know, and, and they're usually comfortable with stuff. Like, I don't remember what meal this was, but for some reason, after the end of the meal, I took out my pen and I drew a Chinese garden on the outside of this Chinese takeout box. And it just sat around for years until I had an exhibit and I wanted to do an installation of Chinese takeout gardens. And what I did is I looked all over the city. I looked all over the city to try and find a Chinese takeout box. It didn't have anything written on it. And I couldn't find it. So what I did is I took one apart. They're really beautiful. They're not really, you know, they're really not what you would call, you know, symmetrical. And I took one apart and decided to, to cut it out on a piece of uh, watercolor paper and then paint a garden on it and fold it back together. And so what I did is I did this installation. These are only three pieces. I did this installation where I, I have the walls covered with illustrating the history of garden design in Chinese takeout boxes. And the next step is to kind of like have it so you can eat the garden inside. Put some types of things that you can open up and, and, and you know, really have a takeout garden. This is, I bought, it, I bought this house from this San Francisco architect named Lars Lara. Uh, when I first saw this house, when I came to Santa Fe, California, I really fell in love with the interior space. And this was a studio that he built outside. And like most architects, he invented this incredible iconography of the evolution of the California bungalow, this idea of the, the natural wall, you know, this whole evolution of things, and the way these things march through space from the, from the front of the house, to the interior of the house, these erased trees that weren't here, this tree that's here, and the tree out of the garden. And for the longest time, I could never find the erased tree in my living room. So I had some students that came over to have Mars as a teacher, and I said, you know, I don't understand it. You know, there's supposed to be an erased tree here, but I've never been able to figure it. And I've been looking on the ceiling for traces, and he goes, well, it's erased. It's not there. It never was there. I mean, so I mean, I spent a year looking for this erased tree, as this architect put there, and it really faked me out. So this was the original garden. Lars is sec he's been married three times, and I don't know if he's still married, but his second wife, no, I should say his third wife, uh, when she moved into this house where his second wife lived, she took a chainsaw and cut the bed in half. <laughs> so these are, these are my first, so the, the idea, what I was looking for in this part was a way to take Lars's grid that he, had, that he had created for this house, and unify my studio out in the back, where I spend most of my days, take that grid, flip it out, flip it down on the ground, somehow create an art. But because the garden is very, very small, and I'm very much interested in this idea of illusionist perspective, this idea of creating uh, you know, objects that will continually change throughout the year, I created a whole series of illusionistic perspectives that radiate off of this, this uh, semicircle that, that, that connects Lars's grid the interior of this house with my studio. So as I move from the interior space to my studio, I'm getting this constant change of effects. And I love piano keys. You know, so I put the piano keys down on the ground, also to further accentuate that idea of illusion. Here I'm, I love axes, but I'm, I'm still using this idea of the central axis through the garden. And what I did is here, I painted a trompe l'oeil, and Lars sold this house to me, and then he moved up into the Berkeley Hills. So what I did is I painted the view from this new house. Here, so I could look at what he was looking at after he ripped me off. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about illusion. You can see everything. There's this idea right here of the ha ha wall, this idea of separating two planes, two ground planes. So this drops off two or three feet. So you're really not aware of that little slot of space. I love cypress trees, so I planted the cypress trees there to remind me of Italy. This, uh, this descending, these glass balls that I really like are descending in space to force the perspective and then the trompoy of the arbor around it and then a little child's chair there. So everything is about kind of miniaturization and illusion. And uh, since I spend, you know, I spend most of my time in this garden, you know, watching the time change and the roses, <coughs> ordinarily I wouldn't paint, I wouldn't plant roses, but I ended up with these roses that were all over the yard. And Lars's second wife loved roses, his third wife hated roses. And she sort of mowed over them. And, you know, so when I bought the house, I didn't have a lawnmower, and all of a sudden, all these roses are rolling up out of the ground. So I slowly started to dig them up and move them off to the spot off to the side, which I found was like absolutely the worst place to plant roses, which is in the shade. But sometimes you just have to go with what's there. I love gazing walls, and maybe there are a lot out in the mid, maybe you're familiar with them in the Midwest, but when I moved to California, nobody knew what they were. And when I did that installation, I had to order, I needed 45 days of and so nobody knew what I was talking about. Finally, I ordered them from Glassboro, New Jersey, 48 days of books. 
And the guy said to me, he says, can I ask you something, Mr. Sullivan? And I said, sure. He says, what are you going to do with 48 days of gloves? And I said, well, I'll send you a picture. And he uses it in his advertising now. But this idea of the glass ball of reflection, of taking the garden, you know, and miniaturizing it down and focusing on something. I mean, they create these beautiful reflections. And to where, to where I sit in my studio, I can watch the sun move overhead. I can watch the reflection of the garden. And I also use them, you know, in descending order to further accentuate that idea of the illusionistic perspective. Now, I want to talk about the final installation that I just most recently done, and it's about illusion. It's about this idea of how we view the landscape. And in the 17th, late 17th century, up until the 16th century, landscape was viewed as something terrifying. Mountains were viewed as implements. I mean, people did not get impediments. People did not look at landscape as sort of this benevolent, romantic vision. You know, it wasn't until sort of it became tame, you know, wars stopped down, people could start to travel. And also this idea of landscape painting. Up until the 16th century, landscapes were painted only as background for religious paintings. And it wasn't until Claude Laurent and Poisson and those painters went to Rome and started to paint the landscape that it started to bear a different viewpoint of the landscape. And I like this being the Zippy the Pinhead, who's one of my heroes. But I love, you know, here we have a picturesque landscape. Zippy starts to enter the landscape, and then he's in the landscape, and he's apologizing. And I, I wonder about that. You know, like, this is our romantic version of the landscape, but anytime anything changes, what are these changes that happen when people enter the landscape? So this whole interesting cult happened in the 18th century. Groups of ladies and gentlemen would go out into the country to look at the landscape. And what they would do to get the, they would go, these stores appeared that would sell them books on how to read the landscape, books of poetry to read in the landscape. They would sell them prints, that when they couldn't go out into the landscape, they could study examples of picturesque landscapes. And this is when the art of watercolor arose. You know, because up until the 17th century, there really wasn't a real watercolor tradition. So the art of watercolor evolved in England as a, as a, as a portable system where people could go out into the landscape and not only read poetry and appreciate it, but paint the landscape. And you'll find like in the Lake District in England, there were, there were walks that you would take, and there were these view frames that would frame picturesque views. Here you have a, a brick or a rock wall with a hole, an aperture cut out, so you know exactly what to look at. And this is what the culture, this is, this is picturesque. You know, you know, like in this landscape, you would know, well, this is good and this is bad. I think that's it. Now, the thing that fascinates me a lot, well, as many things do, is to interpret the landscape this sort of a whole series of optical devices were evolved to, to enhance your appreciation of the landscape. This is called the Claude Mirror. And Claude Lorraine, I, I love irony, Claude Lorraine never used a Claude Mirror. He was dead long before these things ever happened. What a Claude Mirror is, 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 is it takes on many shapes, but it's a plain old convex lens, back with either gold or silver. And you would have two or three mirrors for different times of the day. And what this is, it, it takes a huge, large landscape, and miniaturizes it down to something in the palm of your hand that you can hold up, take in the take out, and look at it and go, ah, you know, I mean, here the landscape is in your hand. I think, and then you would paint it. Painters would use them as a way of reducing the tones and the hues because it reduced the, uh, the, the detail. You'll find that when you go out to paint landscape, it is way, you're way overloaded with detail, and you want to reduce the detail. This is a Claude, these are, these are examples of Claude, Claude lenses, real Claude lenses that are at the, uh, uh, in England at the Science Museum, the Museum of Science and Natural History. And you can see the different shapes that they take. Plano convex and these wonderful little pocket kits that you can carry in your pocket. Uh, sometimes the glass was blue, you know, generally it was darkened with gold or silver in the background. And to further enhance this idea, these are all before the camera. I mean, this is what's interesting. You know, there were no cameras. And uh, this is a, the original camera obscura was something that was used for drawing. You know, and, you know, like it took a long time to develop the photographic reproduction process. But this is a, the device that folded up into a book that you would take out into the field, stick your head into this thing, cover it over, and then adjust this sort of mirror like you're in a tank to the view that you wanted and trace the view if you can't draw. So, you know, artists who could draw didn't have to use the camera obscura. 
But those that couldn't draw had this device, a whole series of devices with aids for drawing the landscape for people who weren't artistic. And this is a camera, this is a camera obscura that's portable. It, you know, it's about this big, it's about the size of a shoebox. And there's a lens. I mean, this is this is the lens. It's, just, it's very simple, just one convex lens, a mirror, and a, and a piece of translucent glass would be placed here. And you take a piece of paper, a transparent piece of paper, and draw the landscape. Well, this was sort of limited in its field of vision. And Varley developed this Varley glass, which sits on a huge tripod. You look at it through the side, and what it does is it has this ability to magnify the landscape at certain distances. And this was more portable and a little easier to use of a device. And here you have an uh, interesting photograph of painters and, and people out in the landscape drawing the landscape. And then because oil painters, the, the great painting societies in England, thought watercolor was beneath them, they decided they refused to exhibit watercolor paintings. So you found um, the two watercolor societies starting in England where they would have these grand salons. And you know, what I find interesting about this is the way, the difference in the way we view things now in galleries, where their things are, paintings are isolated, they're single focused objects. And here, the viewers are surrounded by paintings, wall to wall. I mean, how the hell would you see something up there? I don't know. But, you know, it's this big, it's almost a, a social event. Well, it was a social event. But I like this idea of wall to wall paintings. So, this is a clock mirror that I made. And you can see uh, how it is using it in my garden. You can see how it distorts the landscape, how it miniaturizes it into these three tones. And I made a whole series of them on different stands. And eventually I'll have an exhibit called Optical Delight. And here it is out in, I mean, here you are truly appreciating the landscape. I mean, getting the off factor, taking it out and looking at the, at the landscape. And this is the view of Mount Diablo in San Francisco, I mean, in, in Berkeley, from Inspiration Point. And here is the reflection. So you can see the golden hue. You can see how it takes this composition and turns it into something a little more easy to, to comprehend and paint. You can see the different tones. You can see the, uh, you know, the gradation of light. And it makes it something very interesting. So what I decided to do, I applied for this competition in San Francisco. I decided I'd made these miniaturized clock mirrors. I was very much interested in the perception of landscape. And I had an opportunity to, to uh, apply for a competition and do an installation. And this, this was the site next to City Hall in San Francisco. Four years ago, Francis Butler and I had submitted this piece. And we got into the semifinals, but we didn't quite make it. And what it is, this is a sheet of glass with finely, fine graded um, uh, Duh, not dust, but filings, iron filings. And then this is a large aperture, a large pantograph, that when the Earth would move in San Francisco, this would record through the lines, it would record the movement of the Earth. And also, as viewer operated, as a viewer, you can walk by and turn this crank and create that. And then here's a large reflective mirror, so you can also see the patterns that you were making. I'm really glad that, I'm really glad that we didn't get this. We could have never built something as ridiculous as this. But at least we got a couple grand to get into the final. The other thing that feeds into this installation that I've always been interested in is billboards. But not billboards, not the front of them, but the back of them. You know, like I find this this is for years my dad's family was in St. Petersburg, and in the winter times we'd go down to St. Petersburg, and on the old road, this was the sign for Web City, the world's most unusual drugstore. And I think it's a wonderful sign because here's an image of the earth, and here's an airplane flying around and look, I love these palm trees. The palm trees are really cool. But I like even more the behind it, behind, look at the palm trees here. This is really neat. This all this stuff is really cool. But we don't pay any attention to that. So what I wanted to do, the original idea I had for this is I wanted to create a giant clock here. I wanted to use this idea of the billboard, of the structure of the billboard, this idea of illusion, the backs of landscapes, the the backs of painted landscape, and also somehow in, in, integrate this idea of the metal construction, you know, that goes into the architecture behind this is really phenomenal. And the wind is pretty hellacious in San Francisco. This thing is huge. And I don't know how it doesn't blow away, but somebody engineered this. I think this is a world, you know, like this is one of the seven wonders of the world, you know, that this thing actually can stand, stand up. I want to show you the design process. So, like, it was one day before my project was due. I had this idea for a giant clock, clock glass. And I'm having lunch with one of my best friends. 
in this, in this diner. And I tell, I'm telling her about this idea. And I said, you know, like, unless I can come up with an idea this afternoon, I'm not going to enter this exhibit. And so she sat down and, and uh, you know, like, helped me work out this idea of a giant pod here. You know, that would be something that you would look into, a giant viewing box. That you would look into these three different viewing lots and get a reflection of City Hall, and that would be placed in a Claude Veron painting. You know, the irony of the Claude Veron never using Claude glass, and then the irony of taking City Hall and placing it into this pastoral 17th century landscape, trying to make the point that city government really is, you know, like looking the shepherd of our lives and really looking after us, was the idea. So after I got the idea, I cranked it off and, you know, Ended it. These are some of the original sketches that I, I had done. This was the original idea. I wanted to frame City Hall in this pastoral Broadway landscape. I wanted to have a series of viewing boxes so that one walked by, you couldn't see the plot there. You'd have to look through these little apertures. And here I'm working out the, uh, the view angles. And also you can see these little notes that I'm making, I'm making them myself. And it would be simple. I'd get a huge convex mirror, place it in this large box, and boy, you know, it really needs so this is my best friend, Robert Hewitt, who, I mean, I couldn't have done this without I had student help and uh, several, several really good people. What I did, the next thing I did is I bought a convex mirror and made a frame and painted on the inside of this is a landscape. I made that frame and I took it out there to see if I could get the reflection that I wanted. Then the next thing was to come up with the design and, uh, you know, like, how to create the aperture that was related to the sign. Where was I going to get the large mirror? You know, and, and various things like that. And also, what I wanted to take City Hall and place it in the center of this. This was going to be, you wouldn't see this from the street. This would be, you'd only see the back of this because this would be reflected in the mirror. So I took one of my favorite Claude Laurent paintings and kind of realigned it so I could paint it on, you know, paint it on sheets of plywood and work out all those dimensions. So you can see all these conceptual ideas start to get a dimension. Well, this was all going along completely fine until I did. So I had two weeks before the exhibit, and I couldn't get a mirror. I thought for sure I'd be able to get a giant convex mirror. I couldn't get a big mirror. So Vince and I are driving across the Bay Bridge, and we were behind one of these trucks. <laughs> and I go, Vince, that's what I want. That's why can I get one of those? You know, that's exactly what I was looking for. And wouldn't you know, like I called it Benetto. Well, that was, that was smart. And you know, like I called all these truck guys. I mean, nobody. I went to metal bending. I mean, I, I couldn't. I couldn't find one of these things until sitting on my desk was a, was a working drawing from uh, from Pete Walker's office about spun metal metal spinning. And what caught my eye was Jack Cassidy. You know, called Jack Cassidy. And I'm thinking, Jack Cassidy. I wonder if that's any relation to Neil Cassidy, the hero of On the Road. And I, I looked up metal spinning, and I called the guy up, and I said, uh, you know, are you a Neil Cassidy's son? And he goes. No. And I said, well, look, this is what I want. I want one of these things. I'm trying to explain it over the phone. And he goes, what the hell are you talking about? I don't, I don't have time for this. You know, just bring it down. So I went down there and I found out, you know, and this is how irony works. And how, like, you know, like going forward, if I waited to have the plot mirror, I never would have done the installation. But it's like 10 days before the installation goes up and I don't have a mirror. And I go in and I tell the guy what he wants. And metal spinning was what I wanted the whole time. Is they take these, these dies. And they have these lays, that, and they have these big sheets of aluminum, stainless steel, and they press, they have these guys, it's really great, it looks like the old times, these guys are pushing the metal as it's spinning, and it's bending to the perfect form. So it just so happened to have the perfect form, they have the sheet of aluminum, and then after that I took it across the street to a metal, these metal polisher guys, they polished it up, and I got my mirror, and placed it in this aperture up here. And you can see the idea of the wall, and then this idea of the aperture based on based on um, those large signs. And then the beauty of the thing was, I mean, you can see how time affects things. Originally, I had three viewing holes. Uh, I ended up with two. And what's, what's really wonderful about this is it just, I just, just put a hole in the wall, and people will stop and look. Even if there's a hole on the other side. It was wonderful. It was such a great catch. And originally, the idea was that there would be a wall all the way across. And I didn't have enough paint, so like I slanted it. Actually, this turned out to be better the way it was framed. And uh, you would stop. People would walk by, and it was really wonderful. I mean, even before I finished the thing, people were stopping and looking. And the most amazing thing was, is we were inside the wall working, and we could hear the things that people were saying. It was really, you know, it was quite, it was quite successful. And the most wonderful thing was, 
Uh, Robert and I, on the inside of the wall, this whole class of little kids came by. And the, and the, and the, 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 the teacher was picking the children up and they were looking through the, the, the eye slot. And it was really wonderful. They were going, oh, cool. I mean, you can't have anything better said than, than having a child you know, say, oh, cool, man. So you could see the reflection. It, it worked out perfectly. And as the sun moved out throughout the day, the different parts of the quad moraine landscape were reflected. It gave this wonderful distorted vision of City Hall. You know, and it also, you know, you can see the thing that I was trying to create was sort of this thing of the, of the Web City sign where you have the background of the sign, I mean, the background of the landscape. You know there's something there. It's cut out. But then you can only see the landscape in this reflection. So I like, I like that sense of duality. Here's this big picture frame with no painting. And you know, like, I think this is actually the world's largest plot here. So, in summary, the things I want to say about the importance of this whole idea of the design process. You know, that drawing the design process is not about a single isolated event. You're animating time. You're animating the movement of people through space, the movement of time. You know, you have to think about that. The drawings aren't static things. And drawings are also about imagination. This is uh, one of Davis's, not Davis, but Jack, um, Jack Davis. No, not Jack Davis. I can't remember the guy's name right now. He drew, drew from Marvel Comics. This is one of the fantastic four guys. And if you look at the invention, the drawing is about invention, that you're creating imaginary worlds that, that can eventually become real three-dimensional three -dimensional spaces. And you really shouldn't be combined by your imagination. You should really be able to let your imagination go and create real cool things of wonderment. But the other thing that I think is important that I've noticed about really good designers is they don't, before they design something, they don't worry about, that, that can't be made. They just go ahead and design it. Design it because somebody will be able to make it. That's what engineers are for. And the other thing is your environment. You know, like, what is our environment? I mean, I'm very, very nervous about the future as the comic book readership is really down. This is a really bad sign. <laughs> Video games are really up. I mean, my generation learned to draw from comics. Our whole visual inventory and visual record is based on comics. So what's going to happen when the next generation comes along you know, and their whole visual world is informed on these death games, you know, these, these video games? That's kind of frightening. So everybody should go out and buy five comic books tomorrow. Support the comic book industry. Your environment. You know, the environment that you work in is really important. I mean, it scares me when I go into offices and there's like 300 cubicles, you know, like six feet off the ground, and everybody's in their own little cubicle. I think. The, the most creative offices that I've been in always have the most creative environments. They've been surrounded, people are surrounded by neat stuff. You should like, you should be surrounded by cool stuff. You know, no bad stuff, just cool stuff. And the other thing I want to finish with is life is like cool. You've got to learn how to think ahead, you've got to play the angles, and you've got to shoot through the ball. You've got to keep your head down and always, you know, think ahead. And then the only thing that remains after the struggle is the work. That the struggle is really important, but also a few beers with your buddies are, is just as important. Thank you.